So in this video, I am showing you how I converted our garage into an outdoor screened-in living space. I began this project first because it was probably the most overwhelming of a lot of the projects in terms of how many different pieces and parts needed to be negotiated in order to make it come into fruition. But doing it first also gives me a space to lounge while I'm doing other work in other areas of the yard. And it's also the beginning of a lot of different transformations in and around our yard and our spaces. It just naturally feels good to do this one first. And it's also perhaps one of my favorite projects I've done on Cade Made so far. So that's really exciting for me and I'm really excited to share this with you. I also just realized I have a little over 900 subscribers, so I just want to thank you subscribers, and if you want to see more uploads from me and you haven't subscribed, that's the best way to see them in the future, so go ahead and do that. And if you like this video, that also helps this video get seen to other people. Thank you so much for watching, I hope you enjoy this, and here is the garage conversion into a living space. <sighs> enjoy. This small single car garage is in the rear of our property. It's approximately 12 and a half by 20 feet, which is a nice size space. And it's accessed by a driveway going down the side. You can see it's not here in the early 1930s when that photograph was taken. And then it's here in the 1940s and it's there again. And these photographs are from the late 1940s and they just show the garage on the back of the hillside. This garage was probably purchased as a kit and assembled because a lot of the different wood pieces and the materials were numbered on the inside. Um, clearly you can see it took many different tries to get it fully cleaned out, but after one final big, big, big push that we did over a weekend, my babe Mike and I, we completely cleaned it out and discovered the materials that we found useful made piles of things that went into the trash, figured out what we wanted to give away and put into storage. It was really great and allowed us to start getting a vision for what we wanted this space to become. This lovely primitive old farmhouse cabinet is great and I always wanted to keep it. I just used a little restore finish on it. This is a nice old wardrobe as well, except it didn't fit inside the house. So we ended up delivering and giving it back to the lady we bought our house from. With this line level, I'm going to demonstrate to you that this building actually sits downhill about eight inches. It's just a fact of the building. You don't really notice the tilt that that much, but when building, you definitely have to compensate for the lack of level nature because you can't use a level to make things square. So we need to take the garage door off. You see it has these springs and it has that cable which attaches, which helps the garage lift. I'm gonna to try to detach the cable by cutting it while the garage door is up. Just as a side note, when disassembling lift garages, those springs, especially the more modern ones, these are very old and they didn't have a very strong tension on them, but that can be extremely dangerous. And I actually had clamped the door open on the upper track portion so it wouldn't fall on me after I cut those cables that were tensioned by those springs. Every single bolt on this garage mechanism was a square bolt that doesn't fit standard wrenches and whatnot so after taking off what felt like hundreds of them it was a huge effort and took quite a while to disassemble all of the different pieces another note about this demo process is that none of the things that i removed from this building were compromising the structure and that's one thing that you have to take into consideration when it comes to demoing and modifying structures we did a lot of assessing and making sure that none of the modifications were compromising the integrity of the building. And now the opening is very big. <laughs> I'm using chalk here to draw a template of what I wanted potentially the opening to be on this side of the structure, just to see how it looked proportionately to the building. Because as I mentioned, the building isn't level, I had to make the openings level to the structure, not level to true level and so I used the underside of the lap siding on the exterior as a guide to make my horizontal cuts and then I actually drilled holes from the inside of the structure where I had that template going through to tell me when to stop going on the horizontal and then I cut the verticals. I have to cut off 
these right here. I think I'm gonna try it with the circular saw first. Let's see where that gets me. Yeah, all right. Let's uh, start with the top, I think. That's a good idea. Okay, we're starting with the top. And then Mike's gonna come in and help. All right. We're starting at the bottom, Mike says, because the weight will press down on my saw. I don't know if this is gonna do it. One of the good aspects about this garage as it was built is that what you're seeing on the interior here is not the lap siding on the exterior. There's actually tongue and groove pine boards that line in between the lap and that stud wall. So it really adds to the structure as well, but it makes it difficult to cut through and made those pieces I'm taking out rather heavy. It would have been my assumption that the second side would be easier than the first side, but unfortunately I had dulled the saw blade on that circular saw so much on the other side, cutting through the nails that are holding that tongue and groove in. And so the second side just took me forever. It took me a long time. So it's been a couple days since I made the openings on the sides here and then of course taking off the garage in the front. So yesterday after deciding that we're just going to screen in this space, not have windows on it, I made an aim to go to a local architectural salvage place to find something that could be used as a screen door or screen doors. And I was looking for just a classic look and I walk into a place about 10 minutes away from our house and I'm going down a line of doors and I spot these two screen doors, these beautiful vintage screen doors. And I look at them and I, I look at the tag with the price on it and I'm like, oh my gosh, these are double screen doors. And I'm looking past the sold sign on the doors. And it was 175 for the pair for these beautiful old doors and they were sold. But apparently there was a story behind it where they have a customer who likes to put sold stickers on things and then not come in and get them or pay for them. They wanted to respect that customer, so I had to give them my number and a couple hours later they called me and they told me that I could buy them, but I did offer more money than the 175. I offered two as incentive to sell these doors to me and I was able to buy them, so I got the doors. Look at these doors, they're beautiful. They're a little tall, so they're gonna have to be shortened and I'm going to have to build a frame to go around them so that they're perfectly stable and upright and plumb. And they're going to be absolutely perfect. I will paint them after I shorten them and modify them, but I couldn't have asked for a better solution. I'm so excited. I'm framing out the openings with just simple pine common boards. I believe they're one by six or one by eights, and I'm installing them directly onto the opening rather than making the box frame and installing that separately. Just made more sense to get everything really tight that way. And knowing that I was going to paint the boards, they are not pressure treated. These are the most affordable boards you can buy at most any hardware store. It's funny looking back at this footage because I work by myself so often I don't realize I use my body in such funny ways while installing. I'm using my cheek here to hold that up and straddling the frame to make sure I get it that way. 
It's just funny. Anyway. And here's the completed opening. So that's a beginning. More than anything, I was hesitant to begin the door project because not only were the doors the biggest investment I made on this, but I did not want to mess it up. So I made a drawing to give me confidence to move forward with the framing and the hanging of the doors. So I started with the frames that we're working on basically with are the side lights, the side windows, the framing that the door will be framed onto. And what's not demonstrated here is how much shimmying and minor modifications I made in order to make sure that the door was as easy to install as possible. Because I was cutting these doors down, I added little brackets onto the corners of the inside of the door to help reinforce the structure so that there was nothing compromised there. Using these clamps, I spent a good amount of time just making sure things were level before I started screwing in the hinges for the doors and making those changes to the frame that I had created. I actually had to modify the tilt of the door frame to compensate for the unlevel nature of the garage in order for the doors to hang properly and not slam closed, for example, every time they were opened. And using the salvaged lap siding from the side openings, I started enclosing the front side of the building, which really began showing the continuity from the sides to the front and making the building look a lot more complete. It was an exciting step and move forward. Here I'm using a multi-tooled, which is a fast vibrating saw blade to make the insets for the hinges for the screen doors. It's a really great precision cutting tool and it really cuts down your work time. There's no chipping away for hours. Yesterday, I pulled out the power washer. And if you've ever used a power washer, you know how that goes. It turns into the afternoon of power washing, but it's a little rusticana moment over here, and I need to do some repair on the siding. I'm just gonna replace that whole line to where there's a joint there because it's just, it's gone. That got in depth. I didn't expect anything less though. Although this siding is a bit rough and quite imperfect and some would have replaced it, in our house we embrace the imperfections and the vintage quality of lovely old siding. But I did use this stuff called Peel Stop to help prevent the old paint from peeling further before I put on the new coat of exterior paint. So in this next little moment, I'm gonna be using furring strips. And furring strips are basically, it's the same dimension of a two by four in its this direction and it's like four two by fours just cut boop 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 right so you could use this for framing out and it's not really finished wood at all but it's very inexpensive and if you're doing sort of a rustic job like this it's useful to get inexpensive materials and then work from there but you have to kind of pick out good ones because a lot of times furring strips are not going to be very good quality it's really useful here. This is a big experiment with this, just screening it at first, but I want to leave enough depth on the front so I, if I needed to make some sort of window or something in the future to cover up from the weather, I could definitely do that and fit that in with the screen already in place. Instead of picking new colors for this structure, I am just simply doing a repaint of the original colors from before we owned the house, and I happen to like them quite a bit. So I've watered down the paint because it's so thick and I'm going to try starting with the paint sprayer on the doors first. Do a couple little tests before I hit the doors up but just to measure if the thickness is right. And then as long as it's good, I think I'm going to do the first coat on the doors. I really, really, really like the finish that paint sprayers give you, but I just really do not like how fussy they are, and boy are they fussy. But it really did a fantastic job on these doors, and the finish just came out absolutely perfect for me. I don't know if you're gonna notice this, but I'm gonna go out on a limb and say that the color that was matched for the siding was not exactly the color that was presented initially on the siding. but. Color matching is an imperfect science, and I do not mind this color whatsoever. They do have the formula for the mix that they made for me, so that will have the consistency there. But I think it's a, 
I think it's a little different than what it originally was. I mean, you can kind of see it here. It's a little bit more saturate of a green, but again, I don't mind. Rather than using an interior paint for the inside of this building, obviously with the sides open and it just being screened in, it's more of an exterior space. So therefore I decided to use an exterior flat white paint that was a lot more durable for the conditions that this space will be exposed to. The walls are all painted, including the ceiling. I got these pieces put on before I start screening to just help bracket those screens a bit. And then what I also did was this. That's an operable fan. This is a great angle. An operable fan and lights. Next thing that I need to do is put on the screens onto the interior so that we can work on the floors here. I found these rolls of stainless steel screening material for $5 a roll at a local, somewhat like the ReStore, like a building salvage place. I folded it over on the edges before installing it to reinforce the edges so that the staples didn't pull through the screen as I was stretching it outward. And it was really an improvisational process. I've never done this before, but they actually turned out quite well and pretty taut. Although this isn't the funnest task, there's quite a large gap at the threshold of the screen doors, which I needed to fill in. So I used a bunch of extra concrete mixes that I had, that we had from inside this garage even to fill in that gap and just quickly cement it in. And then using this clean and etch, it's an etching material, which actually roughens chemically up the surface of concrete to help paint attach to it. So you simply wipe it on and then it dries out and you can't even hardly tell, but the, the surface is disturbed so that paint can go to it. I painted the floors using a pre-mixed paint by Benjamin Moore, porch and floor paint. I think it's called Country Red, Country Barn Red, Country Red, I don't know. I'll link it down below, but it's a great paint and it worked perfectly and I love the color. It's got a glow to the whole thing. I know. These oak leaf and acorn brackets were given to us maybe five, six years ago by a friend, and I have been waiting to find the perfect opportunity to use them, and I couldn't have thought of the more perfect opportunity. I absolutely love the dreamy aspect that they gave to the exterior of this space. And I had four of them for each corner of the building. Also, it was great because that pretty much concluded the physical conversion of the garage to this screened in space. When it comes to historic homes that have a lot of character, there's a risk of breaking up the continuity so much with modern aesthetics that there sometimes becomes a really odd visual feedback loop. So here I tried to give a nod to the age of the building and our home while adding a little bit of whimsy as well. There is definitely an elevated and joyful feel to the interior. For the decor and furniture, I decided that I would not buy any additional items beyond what we already had in storage or around the house. So I collected all the things that felt like screened in porch items or summer cabin vibes, which looking at it here now, it definitely has a Southwest vintage casita vibe to it as well. So there's that. Um, but roughly the financial breakdown for paint caulk for the interior and exterior, I'm estimating about 325. For the double screened doors and other lumber and building materials, I'm estimating 375. And for the decor and furniture overall, and this is really high, I'm estimating 150, bringing the total cost of this whole conversion from garage into living space about 850 bucks, without labor of course, but everything is a labor of love here. We have used this space every day 
since it's been finished that we have been home and it is great for having meals and gathering with friends on beautiful summer nights. Mosquito season is encroaching upon us, so I'm very happy we're prepared for that. Otherwise, it's a great space for outdoor projects, some of which I will bring to you soon. And this last scene is just in the evening. It kind of emphasizes the usefulness of the candles on those back wall shelves, which I just think is super pretty. And as always, I just want to say thank you for spending your time with me here today on Cade Made. And I hope to be bringing you other fun, new, smaller projects in the next little bit here. So stay tuned for those. And otherwise, thank you again and take utmost care of yourselves.